Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'd like to thank my friend Dr. Raj Singh and PATH presenter for inviting me to share some bone and soft tissue pathology cases with you uh, for the pathology review course. Um, case number one is an example of osteosarcoma. So let me start by showing you um, a radiograph. So here is a nice classic example of osteosarcoma. They have a wide range actually of um, radiologic features and microscopic features. So I'm just going to show you a couple classic um, images here. And also keep in mind that, of course, I am not a radiologist. So what I'm saying here is my best understanding, but I'm not an expert at this. This is a good example, though, of the mix kind of uh, lytic and sclerotic, the lytic are the, the lighter, I'm sorry, the, the blacker areas and the sclerotic areas where the bone is thicker is the, the more uh, dense white areas. So there's a mixture of lytic and sclerotic components here at the end of a long bone. And you can see that the tumor has grown out of the cortex and into the soft tissue and it's beginning to make these hazy areas of white uh, opaque substance and those correspond to new bone formation, mineralization of osteoid that's being created by the tumor as it invades the soft tissue and that's very characteristic of an osteosarcoma. And the other thing is look what happens to the adjacent bone, the periosteum here has begun to lift up and elevate off of the surface of where the normal bone should be. So that periosteal reaction and periosteal elevation is a characteristic feature of osteosarcoma. And in some cases like this one, you get to see this feature, which is called Codman's triangle that everyone likes to learn about in med school, that the, the lifting of the periosteum and elevation off of the surface of the cortex gives you this kind of triangular uh, shape. So that's characteristic of uh, osteosarcoma. Now let's look at the pathology. Here's a, a core, and you can see that this lesion is composed of very atypical hyperchromatic pleomorphic spindle cells. And these cells are intimately associated with these little strands of dense pink collagen. Now this is osteoid, and it can be hard sometimes to tell apart, well, what's just collagen and what's osteoid? Because remember, osteoid is collagen. It's collagen type 1. So the best evidence, I think, is when you can see these little strands of pink stuff become mineralized and pick up calcium and uh, start to turn into calcium hydroxyapatite. Let me show you another area where you can see that going on you can begin to see here this purple stuff, this is calcium. So as the uh, tumor cells are making the pink collagen and these little strands of collagen eventually become purple and um, to pick up calcium, that's good evidence that what you're dealing with is truly osteoid. And a malignant neoplasm that produces um, osteoid is kind of the hallmark feature basically of what defines osteosarcoma. So there are different varieties and patterns. Uh, areas like this look kind of like the osteoblastic pattern where you have cells that kind of resemble osteoblasts but are much more atypical and they're laying down these woven little strips of osteoid. Um, that's an osteoblastic type pattern if you just had that. But in this one, we actually have other areas that look a little different. These areas actually look a lot like cartilage, atypical cartilage. So if you have a lot of this, we call it a chondroblastic osteosarcoma. And in, um, uh, as you probably remember, osteosarcomas are most common in young people, in, uh, in uh, patients that are between 10 and 20 years of age, but it can occur in pretty much any age range. And there's a second peak um, in older adults as well. But the most common is in 10 to 20 year old, and it's usually in the metaphysis of long bones. Um, about half of the cases occur near the knee. Okay, and so these, um, when you see uh, atypical cartilage in a young patient, I always want to think of chondroblastic osteosarcoma before I think of chondrosarcoma because young people don't usually get chondrosarcoma. That's a disease usually of older adults, uh, whereas osteosarcoma is more common in younger adults. Okay, so this is an example of the atypical chondroid areas you can have in chondroblastic osteosarcoma, and we've seen the osteoid production by the tumor. Um, as far as genetics go, there's a lot of complexity, but two genes to always keep in mind for osteosarcoma is the retinoblastoma gene, RB, and also the P53 gene. So patients that have germline retinoblastoma abnormalities have a higher risk of getting uh, osteosarcoma, and also patients with leaf rameni syndrome where they have uh, germline P53 abnormalities, those are linked to osteosarcoma, but there's a variety of other genetics that's much more complex um, and outside the scope of this uh, review. So osteosarcoma. Okay, next case.
So it's a little hard to orient yourself here. We've got this pizza-shaped uh, you know, wedge of tissue, but this is part of a much bigger lesion. I'll show you a radiograph of a characteristic example. There we go. So here is um, an x-ray from the knee, and you can see this mushroom here, this exophytic polyp growing out of the surface of the bone, kind of near the metaphysis. Um, area and it kind of bulges out of the bone here and note that the stalk of the lesion points away from the joint see it's growing not straight out but it's kind of leaning back away from the joint space and that's a typical um, appearance what we're seeing here of uh, osteochondroma and osteochondromas are these stalk shaped they're not always as perfectly mushroomed like this sometimes they have some weird kind of finger like shape to them but radiographically they're very characteristic they're a very common uh, bone lesion that's seen in uh, many, uh, many people, and they're often kind of discovered incidentally as solitary lesions, although some people have a syndrome called multiple hereditary exostoses, or MAG, um, that they develop numerous osteochondromas, and they have a higher risk of developing secondary chondrosarcoma uh, from the surface of the osteochondroma. Um, and uh, uh, exostosis, by the way, is, a, is an alternative synonym for osteochondroma. So in the long bones, an exostosis and an osteochondroma is the same thing. Um, there have been some genes found to be associated with these, both the sporadic ones and the um, hereditary uh, form of the disease. And these are the EXT1 and EXT2 genes. So EXT, think about that, uh, it's uh, like exostosis. So EXT is the gene uh, to remember here. And they're usually in teens and young adults. Oops. So what we see microscopically is this, there's bone here, and then on the surface you have a cap of cartilage, a hyaline cartilage cap. So here's the cartilage cap, and the thickness of the cap is usually less than one centimeter. It can vary a lot by the age of the patient. That tends to be a little thicker in younger patients as the lesion's growing. And when you look at the cartilage, it does something kind of cool. Look at how it's like clustered into these columns and rows here that go all the way down, and then you can see the cartilage begin to transition into bone. So this is basically the, the tumor recapitulating endochondral ossification, which is the thing that you see in the growth plate of young, skeletally immature individuals. That's, remember, how the long bones grow and how they elongate and extend themselves. So this is basically making endochondral ossification. The cartilage cap is turning into bone down here, and underneath you have uh, nice uh, trabecular islands of bone. And um, the, um, this, uh, this uh, marrow space here basically is contiguous with the marrow space in the middle of the underlying bone. If we go back to the radiograph, you can see that the cortex of the bone lifts up and comes right out. So the outside of the stalk is contiguous with the cortex of the bone, and that middle of the stalk is contiguous with the medulla of the bone. So it's like someone just pinched a piece of cortex and pulled it up, and then it grew out into this mushroom shape. So that's kind of cool. Sometimes the bone is nicely organized under here, but other times it gets a little bit more busy and kind of crazy looking. Again, look at the beautiful columns of um, uh, chondrocytes here and making these nice uh, rows or columns that are um, endochondral ossification. Very beautiful. Um, and then down here, though, this one looks a lot more busy because it's got all sorts of stuff here that looks kind of like cartilage, but it's also getting purple and mineralized. This is basically dying or dead chondroid material from the cap that didn't get resorbed. Sometimes you can see this get kind of trapped into the middle of the stalk, and then it begins to get purple and calcify. So you can have this kind of disorganized uh, necrotic chondroid stuff in the middle of the stalk. Don't let that uh, worry you. Okay, um, the radiographs obviously are important in all of bone pathology. I should have mentioned that at the start. Uh, you you know, you got to see the radiographs and know the, the clinical history for all of pathology, but especially bone pathology, it's so crucial to have good radiographic um, uh, imaging and clinical information and putting that together with the microscopic features. So in, um, in some en uh, osteochondromas, you can see this really nice endochondral ossification, or I'm sorry, endo yeah, endochondral pattern of ossification, but in, um, in adults particularly, the cartilage cap can become very thin and eventually it can actually go almost completely away and you just get this mushroom of bone sticking out of the surface um, with, with almost no cartilage left over on top. So it can really run a range from a very nice cartilage cap like this all the way down to a tiny little thin or even absent one.
Um, so it's just good to know that there's a variety of features that you can see there depending on the age of the lesion. Okay, next case. Um, this is um, an example of osteoid osteoma. And before I show you the path, let me show you the x-ray for this one. Oh, whoops, I forgot to tell you there was a, another picture I had in here of osteochondroma. And again, really nice, nice example of those uh, columns of chondroblasts. Okay, so here's the osteoid osteoma. So we're in a long bone, and you can see right here, see that little, uh, that little dark area? That's a little lytic, uh, little lytic lesion, or a nidus, N-I-D-U-S, nidus. That corresponds to the tumor. So the tumor is actually this little thing right here. And around it, look what happens. The cortex of the bone is kind of normal here, and then here it thickens. It gets a lot thicker. There's white kind of sclerotic bone forming, this reactive sclerotic bone formation around this tiny little uh, lucent, radiolucent nidus. Uh, in the center here. So that's a very characteristic radiographic finding for osteoid osteoma. Here's a closer look at the nidus and then the surrounding reactive bone change. Um, so these are very characteristic radiographically. They're usually very small, less than a centimeter most of the time. And they're usually in young, uh, in kids or young adults between five and 25 years of age most commonly. The clinical um, history is also very important. These are usually painful lesions and the pain is usually worse at nighttime. And also uh, the pain is usually relieved by aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that all of that clinical and radiographic information make these very classic um, they are almost always obvious diagnostically to the orthopedic surgeon and the radiologist. They, they know exactly what they're dealing with here. And if you get one of these in the pathology lab, it's because it's being removed for symptom relief. So let's look at what the pathology is, okay? The, the, um, the feature of osteoid osteoma is that you have a bunch of osteoblasts that are creating a bunch of um, osteoid, which is in the form of these trabeculae. Let's go in closer. The um, osteoblasts are these cells right here. It's a little hard to appreciate them in this area of the scan. Hold on. I think the better area was over here. And, um, you know, spend some time when you're in normal bone looking at osteoblasts. They're, they're plump um, kind of plasma cytoid cells that got a, usually kind of a purple cytoplasm. They have round nuclei with punctate central nucleoli. They can look kind of atypical and weird and scary if you're not used to looking at them. And um, in this case, though, they're nice because they all look kind of like each other. They're all very similar in appearance, and they're laying down osteoid. Now, the problem is, is that if you had a close-up area of one of these, you know, if I told you this was from a lesion that looked like osteosarcoma on a radiograph, you could certainly be tricked into thinking, ooh, that, is, that could be osteosarc. It's, it's cells laying down little woven uh, strips of osteoid. So again, the clinical and radiograph is super important here, and the fact that this is a tiny little lesion is also very helpful helpful. So the bone, um, the trabecular um, osteoid here can be of varying size. These, these trabeculae kind of weave together and interlace with one another. Sometimes they're thin and small um, trabeculae, kind of like we saw out here. See, they can be kind of small little strips of trabecular osteoid production. And then sometimes they get tangled up into these big sheets of dense sclerotic osteoid. So it can really run a range and have a lot of variability. And sometimes there's not much mineralization, not much purple. Sometimes there is more purple um, uh, mineral um, calcium deposition. It just varies from lesion to lesion. So a good example of osteoid osteoma. And of note, osteoblastoma is very similar in appearance um, to osteoblastoma osteoma. The main difference is the size of the lesion. Osteoblastomas are bigger and also um, some radiographic and clinical features, which we're not going to go into because it's a little complicated. But for, for just your memory, remember that osteoblastoma and osteoid osteoma are basically kind of two ends of a spectrum. They're related to each other and they have a very similar appearance microscopically. So a lot of times we don't see a nice big piece like this because osteoid osteomas can get sometimes curetted out. It depends on the situation clinically and how the surgeon's able to get it out. But I feel like most of the cases of osteoid osteoma that I've seen were not a nice big piece of tissue like this. This is a kind of a, a rare treat to get to see uh, one in such, um, such a beautiful, nice laid out piece of tissue. Usually they're more fragmented um, in my experience. And again, a look at the osteoblast. They have that kind of plasma cytoid appearance. And don't let the purplish staining of the cytoplasm make you think that they're big and pleomorphic, okay? 
They are not. And you look, there are a couple little um, osteoclasts, giant cells in here. Remember that in all sorts of bone lesions, both neoplastic and non-neoplastic, you can find giant cells, osteoclastic giant cells. They are a normal part of the bone that participate in bone remodeling. And you can even, look, you can see it happening here. Even though this is an osteoidosteoma, this little osteoclast is trying to eat away at that bone and remodel it. They, they know their job and they're around in the bone. And so um, just because you see a giant cell doesn't mean it's a giant cell tumor. Lots of bone lesions have giant cells. Just remember that. So osteoidosteoma. Okay, next case. Now, speaking of giant cells, this is an example of giant cell tumor of bone. And before we look at the path, let's check the radiographs. Giant cell tumor of bone tends to arise in the epiphysis, that's the end of long bone. So the end of the long bone right underneath the joint space, okay? And they make these large lytic lesions that kind of expand and push outward a little bit. And they can have this kind of soap bubble appearance. Some people describe them as that in some cases, but they're usually well circumscribed and lytic. And we can tell it's lytic because look at the whiteness of the bone here from all of the normal, uh, the normal uh, bone that's mineralized in there. Over here, that bone has been replaced by a cellular neoplasm that doesn't have much bone or mineral in it. And that's why the, the x-rays can go through it more and it looks uh, darker as, as opposed to white, okay? So this lytic lesion here underneath the joint space at the end of a long bone is characteristic of giant cell tumor of bone. So just while we're on that, the, the, um, the main things to keep in mind when you see a lytic lesion in the epiphysis, the end of a long bone, is to think of, in adults particularly, think of giant cell tumor of bone. In younger patients, you can think of aneurysmal bone cysts. They can sometimes have some overlapping radiographic features. Um, you can also think of clear cell chondrosarcoma, although those are very rare. And then also you can uh, think of chondroblastomas, okay? So those are all lesions to keep in mind when you hear about a lytic lesion in the epiphysis. Those, um, those entities should enter your differential diagnosis. All right, now back to the pathology. So the characteristic feature of giant cell tumor bone is, of course, giant cells, but not just any giant cells. The giant cells in giant cell tumor of bone tend to be very large and have tons of nuclei. Now, these are not the biggest, but there's quite a few nuclei in each of these giant cells. Sometimes there's like a hundred nuclei. So I love it when I see those, these giant cells that are much bigger and have much more nuclei than a normal osteoclast would. And also look at how they're arranged. There's not just a few, there is a whole diffuse sheet of giant cells here. And then in between the giant cells, the giant cells are divided from one another by a whole um, sheet in between of, of these kind of oval to round or sometimes spindled uniform stromal cells. So these cells intervening between the giant cells forming a solid sheet, that is the characteristic feature. Like this is a good picture right here of what to remember for giant cell tumor of bone. Now, of course, like everything um, that we're gonna talk about, there are a wide range of variations and, and that's outside the scope of what we can talk about in review session. But basically this is a nice classic example, in my opinion, of giant cell tumor of bone. And I think there's an area over here I wanted to show you. If you look uh, closely at the nuclei of the stromal cells, these kind of oval to round nuclei, and if you look at those and compare them with the features of the giant cell nuclei, they look very similar. These stromal cells look very similar to the nuclei of the giant cells. So that's a very uh, hallmark feature that the stromal cells um, in between the giant cells should have very similar nuclei in size, shape, and appearance to the nuclei inside of the giant cell. And there's some debate over what the relationship is between the stromal cells and the osteoclasts. And you can go do some more reading about that. But just remember that these cells here in between are supposed to look like the nuclei of the giant cells. One other thing I'll point out is that giant cell tumor bone often has 
aneurysmal bleeding areas, it will get secondary aneurysmal bone cyst formation. So it bleeds into itself and makes these cystic areas with blood. When it does that, you'll see hemorrhage and blood, you'll see hemosiderin, and you'll often see areas that become more fibrotic and have more collagen and become more spindled. So if you look at this area, I mean, there's like in this field, there's not any giant cells here, right? but it's still giant cell tumor of bone. Now, if you only had this, you would have a hard time making the diagnosis. Obviously, you have to put all of the rest of the pieces together. Here's some of the more typical giant cell tumor. It's just becoming more streamy and spindled and fibrotic in these areas. And in my experience, it seems to do that more often when it's happening next to an area of aneurysmal bone cyst secondary aneurysmal change, okay? Um, giant cell tumors sometimes make new bone, but in most of the cases, it's not abundant. I've seen exceptions, but here's some new woven bone being laid down. Um, you can sometimes see little islands of new bone formation um, inside and around giant cell tumor, but in most cases, classically, it tends to not be very abundant. Usually there's not a lot of new bone formation, okay? So giant cell tumor of bone with a little bit of a secondary aneurysmal change. Next case. Now, we're switching into soft tissue here for a while. This is, I'll give you a classic history. This is a subcutaneous nodule on the forearm of an adult woman, and she has several other similar lesions on the forearm, and they're painful. So that's the classic clinical history of an angiolipoma. As the name implies, it has angio, vascular component, and fatty lipoma component, okay? And despite the name, these are actually not truly lipomas. They're probably more closely related to vascular tumors that just have abundant fat production. They're not just a lipoma with extra blood vessels. They have different, they're not molecularly the same as lipomas. So this is not just a variant of lipoma. It's a separate entity, um, even though the name makes it sound like it's a type of lipoma. The key is you're going to find the fat looks just like any, any lipoma or like normal subcutaneous adipose tissue. It's just mature adipocytes. The key is finding these little clusters of small capillaries. And right here you can see them. These little clustered capillaries are very tiny little vessels. So we're not talking about a couple of extra big blood vessels and fat. We're talking about these very distinct clustered capillaries. And if the whole thing looks like a lipoma, but I only see, like look here, if I see this little island of capillaries and the rest of the thing looks like a lipoma, I'm still going to call it an angiolipoma. Sometimes you have just very, very tiny foci of these clustered capillaries. Other cases like this one have very um, prominent areas. Like look over here. There's tons of vessels here. In fact, if you got a biopsy that just showed that, you would have a hard time recognizing it's an angiolipoma because it only has a tiny bit of fat. So it can run a range from being predominantly fatty to being predominantly vascular and everywhere in between. But to me, if I find even a little cluster of vessels, I'm happy to call angiolipoma. Um, and the very helpful uh, diagnostic feature, let me see, where is it? I think it's in here. Is that within these little vessels, almost always, you have fibrin thrombi. The fibrin thrombi usually look more pink. In this scan, they've come across as more bright red, but they usually have a pink smudgy appearance that separates them from erythrocytes. Um, and you can see that best under a light microscope on scans. It's a little hard to pick up that refractile quality of blood cells that makes them stand out and look different from actual fibrin thrombus. But these fibrin microthrombi in the lumens of the vessels are so characteristic and they're present almost 100% of the time in angiolipoma. So Capillary vessels, thrombi, mature fat, often painful, often multiple, and often in the subcutis on the forearms of adult women. It doesn't have to be that, but that's the classic scenario. All those things are what you should remember for angiolipoma. Now here's another tumor with a female predilection. This is a nodule from the subcutis in the vulva. And this is an example of angiomyofibroblastoma. Angiomyofibroblastoma is one of a group of different tumors that tends to occur in the genital region. And sometimes these are collectively referred to as the uh, benign genital stromal tumors. Even though the entities are unrelated, they can have some overlapping microscopic features, which we won't go into today. But the main things to remember about angiomyofibroblastoma, that they usually occur in the vulva, uh, and they are composed of these eosinophilic epithelioid or plump spindle cells. So they have an eosinophilic cytoplasm, oval to round nuclei, 
And those spindle cells tend to arrange themselves in cords or strands that kind of stretch out throughout um, the, the stroma here. These kind of chains, cords, strands that are linear. And the stroma varies from being collagen rich, even hyalinized and sclerotic sometimes, to being very loose and mixoid or edematous. You can really run a range there. There also has a tendency in these tumors to have dilated ectatic blood vessels, and sometimes the tumor cells will kind of swirl and whirl around these dilated vessels. So eosinophilic plump spindle to epithelioid cells, cords and chains in a mixoid to hyalinized stroma are the features of angiomyofibroblastoma. Let me show you one of the, oh, there's the area. Really prominent cords. Look at that. You see these very, very long chains and cords of tumor cells stretched out here in the midst of, of this edematous kind of background. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing is that on immunohistochemistry, these cells classically tend to be positive for Desmond as well as for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. Um, but do keep in mind that ER and PR can be positive in many different um, neoplasms in the female genital tract. Okay, angiomyofibroblastoma. So next case, um, this is a nice example of chordoma, right? So chordomas are tumors that most commonly present in and around the bone at either end of the spine, at the top of the spine where it joins to the cranium, and that's called the clivus, or at the other end, at the inferior end of the spine, at the sacrum. So that's the most common site to see a chordoma is at those, those areas, and very, very rarely they can occur in bone and soft tissue outside of those areas, but that's extremely rare. It's good to know that it happens though. Here is the classic thing that you're going to see. This is a tumor that usually is multinodular and multilobulated. This one's kind of one big lobule in this particular slide. It's got a very abundant blue mixoid background. And in that mixoid background, you have cords and chains of epithelioid cells. So these are epithelioid cells that are making these little nests, islands, cords, chains that kind of run throughout this mixoid background. Very characteristic. The cytoplasm can be eosinophilic. Sometimes it's clear. Sometimes you can have more spindling. Sometimes they can look kind of rhabdoid. There's a wide range of features that chordoma can show. But cords and chains of epithelioid cells in a mixoid background, chordoma should be right on that differential diagnosis. What else should be on that differential diagnosis? I'll give you a second to think about it. Well, I'll tell you one other thing I think of right away is myoepithelial neoplasm. So mixed tumor, myoepithelioma, myoepithelial carcinoma. They are also have a tendency to make cords and chains in a mixoid background. And in fact, historically, there was a tumor called paracordoma that we now think is probably a form of myoepithelioma. It's a myoepithelioma that looks very much like a cordoma. Okay? So the other thing to remember is immunohistochemically, um, Chordoma has a unique immunoprofile. It tends to be positive for keratin and also EMA and S100. So keratin plus S100 together, not a lot of things have that, but chordoma is one of the things that does. And the other thing that looks like that, or that stains like that, is actually myoepithelial tumors. They tend to be keratin um, and S100 co-expressing. So this is why historically it was so hard to tell those two apart because they look the same and they can stain the same. Now we have a newer marker and it's called brachyuri. It's a nuclear marker that is very specific um, and sensitive um, for chordoma, but it's going to be negative in myoepitheliomas. Okay? And there are some other things that can make cords and chains too, like extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcoma, which can have some overlapping morphologic features with chordoma and a variety of other things too. But those are some important ones to keep in mind. Let's go to another area over here. The cords and chains are not quite as thin and stretched out. Here they're kind of larger, thicker cords and chains, kind of almost like islands and nests in a way of tumor cells. The tumor cells have a lot more cytoplasm and larger nuclei here. And then another area up here I'll show you. And the reason I'm pointing this out is look at the prominent vacuolation and bubbliness of the cytoplasm. So these are called physiliferous cells. And this is a kind of a multi-vacuolation of the cytoplasm. 
That's a very common and classic buzzword for chordoma. I would say that you don't have to see those. Some chordomas don't have really well-formed physiliferous cells. So it's a good buzzword that people love to talk about. And when you see it, it's great. But I would say to learn chordoma based on the cords and chains and the myxoid backgrounds and don't count on the physiliferous cells to make the diagnosis for you. When I see them, I'm like, oh, cool, physiliferous cells. That's nice. And I show uh, my trainees and we talk about it. But I think you need to be able to recognize chordoma without the physiliferous cells. This is a really good, a lot of this, this particular example of chordoma, a lot of the cells are, mul are single vacuoles, but classically physiliferous cells are like this right here. They have multiple bubbles, multiple vacuoles in each of the cells. Kind of look a little bit, almost like lipoblasts or something like that, you know, the multivacuolation. Here's another one. So those are really good classic physiliferous cells right there. So here's a good example of chordoma. Okay, next case. This is a very nice example of a schwannoma. Schwannomas, everyone learns in med school that they have varicae bodies, but not all of them have good, well-formed varicae bodies. This example doesn't actually, if you look around. So it's important to recognize schwannoma based on all of the other features, not just varicae bodies. When there's varicae bodies, it's, okay, great, that's easy, but it's good to know all the other features because sometimes, both in real life and, and if you're being quizzed by your mentor, you're going to be shown sometimes cases of schwannoma that don't actually have good varicae bodies, and you need to be able to recognize them. For one thing, at low power, we have a very well-circumscribed tumor that's got a thick, fibrous capsule around the outside. Look at that thick, fibrous layer around the outside. And remember, schwannomas arise from peripheral nerves, and they tend to push outward. And so this has kind of got perineurium here. Usually if you do an EMA stain for perineurial cells, you'll often find a layer of perineurium kind of embedded in this outer capsule. So these kind of grow and push outward from the nerve and they take that perineurium with it and then it gets really thickened. Okay, the other thing to remember is that you have hypercellular areas and hypocellular. The hypercellular areas are called Antony A areas and the hypocellular that are kind of loose and edematous, those are called Antony B. See here, there's very few cells. There's a lot of edema, kind of strands of collagen, kind of fluffy, loose areas. That's Antony B. And Antony A is a cellular area. When you find varicae bodies, they're going to be in the Antony A area. You can remember that varicae rhymes with A. Also, you can remember that varicae bodies are made of a bunch of nuclei. And to find a bunch of nuclei, you have to be in the cellular area. But like I said, this case, look, I don't see any varicae bodies. I see a lot of spindle cells scattered around here. But we'll talk about the cells in a minute. you got to learn all the other features before we talk about the cells. These dilated vessels with thick sclerotic walls and often with hemorrhage and sometimes fibrin deposition, that's very characteristic of schwannoma. Schwannoma usually has a variety of changes in the blood vessels. Sclerosis and fibrin deposition in the wall of vessels is a very common finding. You can even see it from low power. Look how thickened the walls of all these vessels are. It's very characteristic. And here's an example actually, where there's actually like a fibrin thrombus filling up a vessel here in the middle of this uh, schwannoma. All right. Um, and hemorrhage is very common, and uh, when you have hemorrhage, of course, hemosiderin can be seen as well. Now, let's talk about the spindle cells. The spindle cells often have scattered pleomorphism. Hyperchromatic, atypical spindle cells scattered around is a really common finding for schwannoma. It's actually kind of a reassuring diagnostic clue. Oh, there, there's some hemosiderin. Look at that. Um, and uh, so scattered pleomorphism is very typical and characteristic of schwannoma and is not a sign of malignancy. And in fact, other nerve sheath tumors like neurofibromas and uh, sometimes granular cell tumors can sometimes have scattered atypical cells in them, okay? So in, in nerve sheath tumors, Schwann cells do that sometimes. The cells will tend to palisade. So sometimes the palisading is beautiful and lined up perfectly, and, um, and those are called varicae bodies. Other times the palisading is much more subtle, and you just get kind of clumping and clustering of nuclei right next to each other, then some space, and then a few more kind of clumped together. And I know that's really subtle, and I always uh, my trainees are always like, what? That's not really palisading. But it's important to learn to recognize when you have a few spindle cells lined up with each other. See these? One, two, three, four, five. They're lined up. These are lined up, these are lined up, um, these are lined up right here, 
Those are lined up there. I know it's subtle and I know it's hard, but learning to recognize subtle palisading of nuclei is really, really important. Not just for schwannoma, but a variety of other uh, spindle cell tumors can have subtle palisading. And when you can recognize subtle palisading, that can be a useful clue to help you uh, recognize those other tumors. All right, so here, without varicay bodies, we have an obvious example of a schwannoma. Of course, S100 and SOX10, which are stains that stain Schwann cells, will strongly and diffusely stain this, but in many cases, the diagnosis is easily made on H&E. Here's some more kind of vague palisading in here. There's a little palisade there, a little one here, a little one there. Okay, next case. Here's a large deep mass, 15 centimeters in the thigh of an elderly adult. This is the classic um, uh, scenario where we see many different high-grade sarcomas in adults. Um, the thigh is the most common site. They're usually large and deep, and um, by the time they're discovered, they're pretty big. And when you go in closer, you see sheets of super ugly pleomorphic cells, bizarre pleomorphic nuclei, hyperchromatic, big nucleoli, the shape of the cells can range from like almost epithelioid like we see here to other areas that can be more spindle. Oh, look at that guy. He's got like two nucleoli, just huge. The bizarre wild um, range of pleomorphism that you can see in adult high-grade sarcomas is, is unbelievable sometimes. Um, here, these are areas where it gets a little more spindled. Okay, so when we see a high-grade ugly sheets of spindle cells as a solitary, large, deep, soft tissue mass in an adult, and they've got no history of cancer, you're probably dealing with a high-grade sarcoma. And the next step that you can do is you can look, is there anything about this that helps you decide what kind of sarcoma it might be, okay? Are there areas that look like fascicles of eosinophilic cells? Then it might be a leiomyosarcoma. Are there areas with obvious... Uh, rhabdomyoblasts. Um, that can be hard to tell sometimes. A lot of tumors have cells that look kind of rhabdoid, um, but you could think about rhabdomyosarcoma, like a pleomorphic rhabdo, which um, although rare, do occur in adults. Um, the other thing that you should always look for is are there lipoblasts present? Pleomorphic lipoblasts in a high-grade sarcoma, that's going to be a pleomorphic liposarcoma. Or is there a well-diff liposarcoma adjacent to this tumor? If there's a well-diff liposarc, um, right next to, if there, if there was well diff liposarc here and sheets of um, high-grade uh, sarcoma right here, then this would be called a D-diff liposarcoma. So the context and finding other components are what help you. But if you don't find any obvious line of differentiation and you do some stains and prove that it's not a carcinoma or a melanoma, what I usually do with a tumor like this is I do uh, four stains I vary, vary this depending on the situation, but I usually do a pan-keratin, an S100, an actin, and a desmin. And if those are all negative or have only rare focal staining, then I would say that this is an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. The old name long ago for this was MFH, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, and that name has been obsolete for many years now, so don't use that. But uh, UPS, or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, is a high-grade sarcoma that is undifferentiated. That means it has no obvious line of histologic differentiation, either by light microscopy or by immunohistochemistry. Okay, So it's kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no specific marker or molecular test to um, prove the diagnosis. You just have to rule the other stuff out. Okay, And you do that by a combination of the clinical scenario and looking around for other types of cells like we just talked about and doing some immunostains, okay? So this is a good example of UPS, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And remember that pleomorphism, as a general rule, is a sign of aneuploidy, multiple random chromosomal gains and losses, okay? So tumors like this are not going to have an easily testable gene because they have abnormal genes, but the genes and the chromosomes are different abnormalities every time. You might have a few extra copies of the long arm of chromosome 3 or extra or, or loss of chromosome 10. It can vary every from case to case, so there's not any specific molecular you can test for. And as another general take-home point, when you see pleomorphism, you're probably not dealing with a translocation sarcoma. Uh, sarcomas that have balanced gene rearrangements or translocations, fusion genes, most of those, there are some exceptions, but most of those have uniform monotonous nuclei. Ewing sarcoma, synovial sarcoma, low-grade fiber myxoid sarcoma, all of those. The cells all look like each other because they all have the same molecular abnormality and it's a gene fusion. 
pleomorphism is not usually seen in uh, translocation sarcoma. So I think that's a really useful take home point that one of my mentors, Dr. Mark Edgar taught me and it's been super helpful for me as a soft tissue pathologist. Okay, next case. All right, so this is a very nice example of a solitary fibrous tumor in the olden days. These were called hemangiopericytomas and we still use the term sometimes hemangiopericytic vessels for this very unique vascular pattern that we see, but I will point out it is just a vascular pattern, okay? This is the characteristic feature that's seen in many solitary fibrous tumors is these dilated, branching, staghorn-shaped vessels. Um, but we can see that vascular pattern in a wide range of other tumors. Synovial sarcomas often have vessels like this. Fibrosarcomatous dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans has vessels like this. Many different tumors can have dilated staghorn vessels, okay? Sometimes they're really big branchy vessels like this. Other times you just can have small vessels like that that kind of maybe branch once or maybe they're just dilated and kind of round. So the range of vessels that you can see in a solitary fibrous tumor is pretty broad. It can go from these small dilated ectatic vessels all the way up to these huge ones like this, okay? The other thing is there's cellularity here. There's a, a sheets of spindle cells in this area and in these areas, there's a lot less cellularity. Look, it's more pink and less blue. So there's more cellularity here. Over here, there's more collagen and less cells, fewer cells. So that range of, of a cellular with hypocellular sclerotic zones and the presence of dilated vessels from low power, we haven't even gone in close yet, but from low power, those things should make you think of solitary fibrous tumor. Oh, and I meant to point out at the beginning, hemangiopericytoma, I believe, is still used in the central nervous system. I leave that to the neuropathologist to, to comment on. Um, but elsewhere in the, the soft tissue, outside of the CNS, we don't really use the term hemangiopericytoma anymore. There is one tumor in the nose called a glomangiopericytoma or a sinonasal hemangiopericytoma-like tumor, those are um, thought to be variations uh, and kind of re relatives of glomus tumor. And that's about the only time that the name hem hemangiopericytoma comes up anymore in modern um, soft tissue pathology, um, again, outside of the neuropath world. Okay, so the cells, let's go closer. The cells of solitary fibrous tumor are usually these bland, oval to spindle shape, kind of plump spindle cells or oval uh, nuclei, and they often have abundant collagen in between them. Sometimes you get these like ropey uh, collagen bundles in the backgrounds. The vessels often have thick sclerotic walls. There's often sclerosis, and sometimes there are big zones of, oh, like here, these big areas of hyalinization where there's very few cells right around the vessels. That's characteristic of solitary fibrous tumor. And then over here, in the more cellular zone, you can see the cells again, very bland usually. There are malignant forms and high-risk forms of SFT. That's a conversation for another day. But if you start seeing pleomorphism or a lot of mitoses or necrosis, those are features that can concern you that maybe you're dealing with uh, one of the um, uh, higher risk forms, okay? And then the cells in general are supposed to be arranged like this in a patternless pattern. Um, I believe it was Dr. Stout in the early 1900s who described um, the patternless pattern and uh, these, these cells are just kind of haphazardly arranged. Sometimes you can see them in kind of short fascicles or areas that look almost like a touch story form or a bit palisaded. See like here, these cells are kind of lining up. So sometimes there is a little pattern, but usually they're kind of uh, just kind of thrown together and swirling around here uh, randomly with the collagen and the dilated vessels. Solitary fibrous tumor is classically positive for CD34, and I will point out to you that CD34 is positive in many different fibroblastic tumors, okay? So it is not a specific marker. You have to use it with a great deal of caution. It can be very helpful because it's a very sensitive marker for some things, but it's not specific. It can be seen in DFSP and solitary fibrous tumor and spindle cell lipoma and on and on and on, and also in vascular tumors too. So it's useful in certain contexts, but CD34 is relatively relatively nonspecific. Um, the uh, other thing is that, that solitary fibrous tumors have a translocation that produces them. It's the NAB2 STAT6 translocation. And this is one of those times where, for kind of a complicated reason, the fish um, looking for that gene fusion 
doesn't always work perfectly and the um, immunostain actually works really well. So in these tumors, I don't send for molecular. If I need to do something to confirm the diagnosis, I order a STAT6, S-T-A-T-6, STAT6 immunostain, and it's a beautiful, very nice, strong nuclear marker that will stain these and it's relatively sensitive and specific so far um, for solitary fibrous tumor. So STAT6 is the uh, marker to remember for solitary fibrous tumor. Okay, and I think that's the end of part one. Let's go over to the cases in part two. All right, uh, this is an example of epithelioid sarcoma. You can see we're in or near the hands or feet. This is thick acral skin. It's got a thick stratum corneum, and it's got a nice um, stratum lucidum, that little pale pink band there, which you only see in acral skin or in skin that's been rubbed or scratched. And then down here in the dermis and subcutis, you've got a multi-nodular tumor. There's multiple nodules and lobules of tumor invading down. Um, there's a lot of fibrosis in the backgrounds. Some of the nodules have zones of necrosis in the center, and although this particular case doesn't um, really do it, some cases of epithelial sarcoma can closely mimic deep granuloma annulari or rheumatoid nodule. They can have that necrobiotic, palisaded necrobiotic granuloma appearance. This one obviously is much more cellular and I don't think anyone would have trouble confusing these, but it's important to remember though that sometimes they can look like rheumatoid nodule and obviously mistaking epithelioid sarcoma for rheumatoid nodule or vice versa would be a disastrous mistake. The, um, oh, here's an area of necrosis right here, tumor cell necrosis. Let's go up to the top though. and take a look at these tumor cells. They are epithelioid cells. They have a lot of abundant pink cytoplasm. The pink cytoplasm in some cases is so dense and abundant that it almost gives the impression of like a, of like a squamous cell, a keratinocyte. It can look like it's so dense. And that's because these cells are in fact loaded with cytokeratin filaments in their cytoplasm. So if you do an immunostain, they will be positive for cytokeratin and also for EMA, okay? So it's important to not mistake them for carcinoma because of the they have an epithelioid appearance and they stain with epithelial markers like EMA and keratin. So the, the growth pattern here, this multiple nodules in the dermis, that would not be typical of carcinoma except for maybe, say, a metastasis. And also, most of the time, epithelial sarcomas arise in children and young adults. I've seen them in people as old as 90 years old. I've seen them the whole range of ages, but they are much more common in um, they, they more commonly arise in young people, okay? They are actually quite a rare tumor though overall. So I guess I shouldn't say they're common, but when they do arise, they have a tendency to be in young people. So they have abundant pink cytoplasm and the nuclei are round or oval and they often have this cleared out, very vesicular pale chromatin, okay? It makes them have this kind of shiny look, this kind of white look to the nuclei. That's another thing that Mark Edgar taught me is that it's like a lights reflecting off of them. He just has, a, a Mark uh, has such a great way with visual analogies that really work and resonate with me at least. So um, this, this vesicular chromatin that's got a kind of white or um, appearance to it is characteristic. There's often uh, punctate or even big prominent nucleoli in the middle. And usually if you look around, you'll find mitoses, mitotic figures. I will point out that both granuloma annulare and rheumatoid nodule can have mitoses too. But usually if you go to higher power, you can easily see that there's a lot of atypia in these tumors. Um, and that quickly tells you that you're not dealing with a rheumatoid nodule or a granuloma annulare. So if there's any doubt, you can do immunostains. Keratin and EMA will stain this. CD34 is often positive. Like I told you, it's not a specific marker. And in the old days, people would try to do combinations of that. But now we have a much better marker, and that's the nuclear stain INI1 or SMARC-B1, S-M-A-R-C-B1. And though that stain is lost in the nuclei of epithelioid sarcoma in most cases, okay? So you'll have positive staining in the background normal cells, but the tumor cells will have negative nuclei, loss of INI1. Now, that's not a specific stain. There's a growing list of tumors that have INI1 loss, rhabdoid tumors in the brain, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, rhabdoid tumor in the kidney, and a variety of others. And you can go and look that up online and study that because that's a, that's a hot topic and a, and a growing um, area of interest 
and research, so know about the different tumors that can have I and I1 loss. But in the setting here of, you know, usually these are the, the distal extremity of young people, often like on the, the ankle or foot or the, the, the hands or the wrist, um, and they can grow um, for a long time before they're diagnosed, unfortunately, and they tend to metastasize kind of in an almost sporotrichoid pattern where they spread in the soft tissue and the skin upwards, up the extremity, and they get into the lymph nodes. They often, um, unlike many sarcomas, um, most sarcomas do not go to lymph nodes, but the ones that do, epithelioid sarcoma is one of the, the ones that commonly will metastasize to lymph nodes. So very bad, a very aggressive tumor, unfortunately, and thankfully it's very rare. So epithelioid sarcoma. Uh, this is a nodule in the subcutis, and it's got a loose kind of bluish mixoid or edematous appearance. The, the cells are spaced out from each other by this background uh, that's, that's edematous and mixoid. The lesion's composed of bland but kind of plump spindle cells with kind of a purple amphiphilic cytoplasm. That's really characteristic of myofibroblasts. Myofibroblasts usually have this kind of plump um, appearance with a purple kind of cytoplasm. Okay, so these are myofibroblasts that are spaced out with edema and mixoid background. They're scattered erythrocytes, red blood cells, and hemorrhage. You can sometimes see a proliferation of small blood vessels. There can be areas that are more cellular. Mitoses are present. So this is nodular fasciitis. So mitosis here. Let's go over to the other piece. Ah. So one feature of nodular fasciitis that I find really helpful is the presence of mixoid cystic degeneration. The lesion tends to get this cystic change where the, where the cells break apart and fall apart and leave cystic spaces. Sometimes it's very small and focal like this. There's just some very focal cystic degeneration here. Other times it can be larger cystic spaces, okay? The cellularity can vary from being real loose and to up to other areas that can be more cellular. And sometimes the cells will be arranged in short fascicles, but in general, you don't see broad sweeping fascicles um, in nodular fasciitis. It's either short fascicles or haphazard arrangement of spindle cells. Um, sometimes you can have scattered giant cells, like these little osteoclasts scattered in here, particularly near, ember, near these little cystic areas, you can see that. And in older lesions, you can see sclerosis and keloidal collagen bundles. These often are um, uh, on the extremities of young adults. They often are painful and arise quickly, like in the period of one month. And most of the time, they're three centimeters or smaller. You don't want to call something nodular fasciitis if it's a 10 centimeter lesion, okay? You're just, you're almost certainly going to be wrong. And the other thing that people like to talk about is this tissue culture arrangement of the myofibroblasts. So this is like analogous to the way cells in a culture dish grow in a laboratory. Most, well, I've never done cell culture, so I've never seen that in real life, just pictures. But what I find more helpful is to think of this as loose kind of feathery arrangement. The cells become more, more plump. They stretch out little multiple cytoplasmic processes. They become more triangular, or the word that some people say is stellate, star-shaped. Um, I think st stellate, to my mind, doesn't look like a star. It looks like a triangle more. So I think stellate is kind of a misnomer. It's, it's not like a real star to me. But these, these feathery areas where the cells kind of stretch out and spread out like this, this is what people call tissue culture arrangement, or I call loose and feathery arrangement. It's a very typical finding in nodular fasciitis. And again, don't worry about the mitoses. Mitoses are present, particularly in the earlier proliferating stage of nodular fasciitis. Mitoses can be abundant. You will not usually, though, you shouldn't find atypical mitotic figures. And even though the cells can be large and plump here, you shouldn't see big, hyperchromatic, ugly pleomorphic cells like we saw in that sarcoma earlier. You shouldn't see things like that. Okay, so if you see pleomorphism and, and really marked atypia or atypical mites, then maybe you're dealing with something different and not nodular fasciitis. But this is a really nice typical example of nodular fasciitis. Sometimes it can have areas that resemble granulation tissue, and I feel like granulation tissue, which is composed of myofibroblasts, have a lot of overlap morphologically with fasciitis. And sometimes I'll say that something has a fasciitis-like appearance, and that can encompass all of the different members of the fasciitis family, as well as a range of reactive um, uh, uh, tissue changes. It's really important to be able to recognize this pattern, though, so that you don't mistake it for malignancy. Nodular fasciitis nodular fasciitis is benign. It used to be thought to be a reactive lesion, but now there's evidence actually that it is probably 
a neoplasm because many cases have MYH9, USP6 gene fusion. So we don't usually need to test for that in real life, but that's a good thing to know about. I, I don't usually use that, that fish in my practice, but, but it has been shown to be positive in many cases of nodular fasciitis, which suggests that maybe this is an unusual form of neoplasm. And uh, these uh, are benign tumors, and um, they sometimes even go away on their own. Other times they are treated with simple excision, but the, the patients have a good outcome. Now, this is an example. The, ignore the label here. It says nodular fasciitis, but actually we're dealing with a special variation of nodular fasciitis. So this is does have all the features of nodular fasciitis. we got beautiful example of myxoid cystic degeneration. This is just really, really classic and nice, perfect. So there's the cystic degeneration. Also, it's a small lesion. And look, it's arising right. This is nice. You don't always see this, but it's arising right off of the fascia. This band of dense, regular connective tissue here is fascia. Uh, tendon would look the same way. It just depends where you're located in the body. Sometimes you don't see the fascia next to nodular fasciitis because the lesion is pushed up into the subcutis and the surgeon didn't go all the way down to the fascia when they took it out. So in this case, though, you can see it coming right off of the fascia and growing up into the subcutis. We got the nice myxoid cystic change, loose background, spindle to stellate cells, hemorrhage, all the stuff we talked about. But there's also some extra stuff here that we're going to talk about. Look at these big, plump, round cells that have large, round nuclei and prominent nucleoli. They look like little eyeballs staring back at us. Kind of scary looking, huh? So these have been called ganglion-like cells. They look kind of like the ganglion cells you, uh, you see in a nerve ganglion. But in this case, they're actually um, a variation of, of fibroblast or myofibroblast, and they're just scattered around here in a lesion that otherwise looks like nodular fasciitis. When you see a bunch of these ganglion-like cells in a lesion that looks like nodular fasciitis, we call it proliferative fasciitis. Or if you put this down in the skeletal muscle, you could call it proliferative myositis. It's the same kind of substance, just different name that we give it based on where it's localized. But if it's in the subcutis or at the fascia level, you can call it proliferative fasciitis. In either case, it's a benign process. So the name that we give it is not super important. Um, it's just to know that this is benign. And it's really important here because these cells look scary. Um, and again, you see these big cells with big nucleoli like that. And then you see mitoses like right there. Look, there's a mitosis. There's this double eyeball staring back at us. How do we know this is not a sarcoma? Well, I'll tell you, the thing that helps me the most is a few things. One, the ganglion-like cells are scattered and spaced out from each other. They're not in a big cellular sheet, okay? Although actually in pediatric cases of proliferative fasciitis and proliferative myositis, sometimes they can get kind of cellular and those are a little scary, but outside the scope of what we're talking about today. So I like the fact that the ganglion-like cells are scattered and spaced out from each other in a loose myxoid background. I like the fact that elsewhere you have all these other features that are just like what you'd see in nodular fasciitis, spindle distellate myofibroblasts, a hemorrhage, the myxoid cystic degeneration, the small size of the lesion, all of that stuff. So seeing the scattered ganglion cells in the background of nodular fasciitis, that's what helps reassure me that what we're dealing with here is just proliferative fasciitis and not some sort of malignancy. But it's really important and it's, a, it's, an easy, it's an easy mistake to make if you don't recognize this lesion. So burn that into your mind. This is proliferative fasciitis. Now, let's go back to bone for a second. This is an example of aneurysmal bone cyst. And I wanted to talk about it here because, surprisingly, it seems like there may be some sort of relationship um, between aneurysmal bone cyst and nodular fasciitis. I mean, they're clearly different things. This arises in the bone, and it does have a lot of features that are different, but it has many cases of ABC have a fusion of the USP6 gene. And they also tend to have some areas that have a fasciitis-like appearance. So I think it's helpful to, to show them together to remember that. Usually these are lytic, balloon-like lesions that kind of expand the cortex of the bone and push and blow outwards into the soft tissue. They have a relatively characteristic radiographic appearance much of the time, so the radiologists usually know that's what they're dealing with. If you do a CT or an MRI, you'll see fluid-fluid levels 
I don't have images of that uh, prepared to show you, but uh, those are kind of some of the buzzwords. They can occur, they're usually in young patients, the majority occur before 20 years of age, but I've seen them in adults also. And um, they can occur in, in a wide variety of bones. You know, many bone tumors have specific bones they occur in, but aneurysmal bone cysts can occur in lots of different bones. So let's talk about what we're gonna see here. And this is a really good example because it's a nice big uh, piece that's relatively intact. The aneurysmal bone cyst is a multi-loculated cystic lesion filled with blood. When we get it and, um, and process it, a lot of the blood will wash out and leave these open, empty cystic spaces. Sometimes, depending on how fragmented the specimen is, you may see just these little cyst walls here, but not see actual intact cysts. So that's okay. This is a good one to learn on because we can show what all of the features are when it's all arranged together. But it's also good to recognize when you just get some strips of stuff like this that, oh yeah, that could fit nicely for aneurysmal bone cyst. So blood-filled cystic spaces, again, the blood's often washed out, but you'll often find hemosiderin and little pockets of hemorrhage retained. The walls of the cystic space are composed of kind of loose fibrous tissue with a kind of edematous background, kind of resembling granulation tissue or fasciitis actually. See how they kind of look like myofibroblasts that are loose and spindled and then there's some dense collagen in the background. Here's some hemosiderin. Okay, the, the space is not really lined by any true lining. It's kind of a pseudocystic space. Um, and what you'll often see in these walls is the really, there's loose stuff like this, but also some very dense collagen that's sclerotic and sometimes actually true osteoid. See here, you can tell that this is osteoid. It's beginning to make bone. And the, um, the bone, the osteoid production, often kind of forms these parallel linear arrays in the wall of the cystic space. See here? We've got this like strip of osteoid, of bone production here, that's being laid down right along the septa of this, um, of this cyst uh, lining. So in between the cysts, you have these um, uh, septa, and in the septa, you've got the fibrous tissue and also the dense osteoid sometimes being laid down. And it's kind of a, you know, it can really run a range from really nice, well-formed bone um, down to just kind of dense sclerotic collagen, and it kind of can be everything in between. Um, okay, so we've talked about the, the septal lining, the blood-filled cystic spaces. Uh, there's often a lot of new bone production, a lot of reactive woven bone formation in and around aneurysmal bone cyst. Here's woven bone, these little islands of bone, and you can tell it's, well, let's see, this one's not as in focus. But woven bone is little thin collagen strands all mishmashed together, and it doesn't have the nice um, concentric lamellar uh, rings that you see in lamellar bone. So woven bone is always a sign of new bone formation. So it's basically always a is always a pathologic process, not always malignant, but it's always abnormal to see woven bone, um, at least as far as I understand. Okay, so the um, oh yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to show you. So nice example of the, the lining of the cyst, but look at these cellular areas here. You tend to have pockets of cellularity with large osteoclastic giant cells. So you can have areas that are giant cell rich in an aneurysmal bone cyst, and you don't want to confuse that with giant cell tumor of bone. There's another area right here. See, there's like a collection of giant cells, and if you take one little area like this, it can look quite a bit like what you see in giant cell tumor of bone. And remember, giant cell tumor bone can have aneurysmal bone cyst formation, secondary aneurysmal change, okay? So the, the way to tell them apart, there are cases in real life that can be really challenging to tell apart um, and sort out for certainty. But here, the vast majority of the lesion is this kind of fibrous and fasciitis-like um, uh, loose tissue and bone and um, septal lining for blood-filled spaces with only a few pockets of giant cells. So this is aneurysmal bone cyst. If the majority of the lesion is sheets of giant cells and then you have some little pockets of blood, then that would be better for a giant cell tumor of bone with secondary um, aneurysmal bone cyst formation. All right, here's another example or another area where we got some giant cells. See, there are a lot of giant cells here, but they're just these little pockets within the aneurysmal bone cyst. So it's actually quite common, though, to see um, pockets of giant cells in an ABC. So just remember that giant cells don't always equal giant cell tumor of bone. So this is a really nice example, again, of aneurysmal bone cyst and um, 
Uh, if you look in the, um, the links, uh, in, if you haven't seen the slides ahead of this, you can go back and review these slides on Path Presenter. Um, the links will be posted with the video. And uh, this is a good slide to spend some time exploring to really get a feel for the classic features of aneurysmal bone cyst. Now we're dealing here with something from the bottom of the foot. Um, here is dense regular connective tissue, a big thick bundle of it. So this is tendon and you can see these are fibroblasts and really thick collagen in between. So this is tendon and um, the coming right off of the tendon is a spindle cell lesion and it's ill-defined and you can see it's growing right out. Here's the tendon coming along. And then here's the tumor cells that just kind of arise right out of the tendon and grow and form this nodule. It looks relatively blue compared to the pink of the background tendon. And the cells though are very bland and they're arranged in these broad sweeping fascicles. See, look at all these, I'll get it stabilized here. All these spindle cells, they're all running in the same direction, kind of sweeping across the screen. They're parallel to each other. And the spindle cells, even though it's kind of cellular, each of the cells is divided from its neighbor, more or less, by strands of pink collagen. There's little collagen fibers in here. So these are fibroblasts or myofibroblasts. I use those terms. I lump those two together diagnostically um, uh, because uh, they often have kind of an overlapping feature, myofibroblasts and fibroblasts. So for the purposes of talking about lesions, I just say it's a fibroblastic or myofibroblastic lesion. They, I think of them as the same thing. Um, so in any case, though, this is an example of fibromatosis. Um, which is, it's got some similar features to what you'd see in uh, desmoid fibromatosis um, elsewhere in the soft tissue, but in plantar fibromatosis, it looks a little different. For one thing, it's much smaller. Uh, of course, it's going to be on the plantar surface of the foot arising out of the uh, tendon, and it tends to look more blue than desmoid fibromatosis because it's a lot more cellular usually. I feel like plantar fibromatosis tend to be pretty cellular, but even though it's cellular, the cells are divided from each other by collagen. So those broad sweeping fascicles is very characteristic. You will often find mitotic figures scattered in these. Do not be worried by that. That's a very common finding, particularly in plantar fibromatosis. Now, closely related to plantar fibromatosis is palmar fibromatosis, or Dupuytren's contracture, which arises in the tendons in the hands. But those are usually really tiny lesions. They sometimes you might find just you might find like just an area like this. Just a couple little fascicles, and that whole thing is all that there was to the lesion. Uh, but it's enough to pull on the tendon and make a trigger finger, so they go ahead and they, they may surgically treat that to release the trigger finger. So I find that it, plantar fibromatosis is much bigger, much more cellular, more blue appearing because there's more nuclei, often has some mitoses when you compare it uh, or contrast it with the, the palmar fibromatosis counterpart. And of course, desmoid fibromatosis in soft tissue also has broad sweeping fascicles, but it's much bigger and deeper. And is, is um, even though it's similar in appearance to plantar and palmar fibromatosis, really kind of a separate disease in the way that it behaves um, and so should be thought of se separately. But one thing that does, uh, that does need to be noted is that um, even though we don't usually need immunostains to recognize these tumors most of the time, um, classically what you should know is that there's nuclear expression of beta-catenin. So beta-catenin nuclear staining can be seen in desmoid fibromatoses and also in palmar and plantar fibromatoses. Now molecularly there's a difference in the way that this works and it's more complicated than we'll go into that the desmoid tumors though have actual genetic abnormalities either of the beta-catenin gene or of the APC gene which regulates beta-catenin whereas in palmar and plantar fibromatosis to my knowledge there's not an actual genetic abnormality that causes this but beta-catenin builds up through other mechanisms. Um, so in any case the outcome is the same that there's going to be beta-catenin staining in my personal practice, I don't find beta-catenin very useful usually because I think it's very dirty stain that's hard to interpret. It often stains the cytoplasm and it's only the nuclear staining that actually matters. So nuclear beta-catenin is the classic thing that's positive in fibromatosis. But like I said, I think in practice, um, the H&E morphologic features are much more important and beta-catenin can be really challenging to interpret for me at least. So that's palmar fibromatosis. Okay, here we've got a large deep thigh mass again. We go down to higher power and we can see it's composed of super ugly, nasty pleomorphic spindle cells. 
arrange it in these diffuse sheets here. So it looks, their areas like this look just like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, okay? But in this case, when we look around, we find that there are some cells that have a line of differentiation. There's a dipocytic differentiation here, as is evidenced by these cells, which are pleomorphic lipoblasts. So pleomorphic lipoblasts have ugly pleomorphic nuclei, and they have clear, sharply circumscribed vacuoles of varying size. Sometimes they're small, like this. We can't see the nucleus here because it's out of the plane of section, probably. But sometimes multiple small vacuoles, sometimes bigger ones, but they're white, it means they're clear, empty. They were filled with lipid that washed out during processing. They indent and push into the nucleus oftentimes, and um, they're nice and sharply circumscribed. So here is a variety of different pleomorphic lipoblasts. Here's one right here with tiny little vacuoles. This one here has much larger vacuoles. So when you see a high-grade sarcoma with pleomorphic lipoblasts, that is pleomorphic liposarcoma. Now, D-differentiated liposarcoma is also high grade, but the majority of those do not have lipoblasts. They are liposarcomas because they arise from well-diff liposarcoma um, as a precursor lesion. There is a small subset of D-diff liposarcs can have lipoblasts, but as a general rule, what I tell my residents is if you see a high-grade sarcoma with lipoblasts, especially if you're in the extremities, the arms, the legs, almost certainly what you're dealing with is a pleomorphic liposarcoma, and usually D-diff lacks this, although if you're in the retroperitoneum, which is the much more common site for D-diff liposarc and a very rare site for pleomorphic liposarc, if you're in the retroperitoneum and you see a high-grade sarcoma with some lipoblasts, then more likely you're actually probably dealing with a D-diff liposarc that's breaking the rule and having some lipoblasts. Um, and you can use MDM2 testing, which is usually gonna be negative in pleomorphic liposarcoma, uh, although there have been very rare exceptions to that, um, but it's going to be positive in D-diff liposarcoma. So that's a little bit out, the, out of the, uh, the uh, spectrum of what we're talking about. Look at how huge that cell is. I would say that in my experience, and I've seen a lot of different sarcomas, pleomorphic liposarcoma has some of the wildest, most bizarre pleomorphic atypia in the entire spectrum of human malignancy. These just enormously ugly, crazy looking cells. I mean, look how even that cell is bad, but this cell is like 10 times bigger than that. It's just nuts. It's crazy. So super bizarre and ugly cells, and you can see more and more different variations of lipoblasts. Some cases of pleomorphic liposarc have tons of lipoblasts, sometimes even sheets of them, whereas other cases, you might have to look through the whole tumor and you may only find a few. So it really can vary a lot. There's a lot of variability. You can have myxoid change in the background of um, a pleomorphic liposarc. In fact, pretty much all liposarcoma variants can have some myxoid background. So just because it's a liposarc with some myxoid change, doesn't mean it's myxoid liposarcoma. Remember, those are translocation sarcomas. I don't have an example to show you today, but they should not have pleomorphism like this, okay? So this is a pleomorphic liposarc that actually has some myxoid background change as a secondary uh, feature. All right. I don't know the history on this one for sure, but I think that what we're dealing with is a nodule in the... the, um, the uh, vulva or vagina because we have it'd be either the um, labia minora or the vagina, I suspect, because what we have here is squamous mucosa. It's got those vacuolated glycogenated cells up top and it lacks a granular layer and a stratum corneum. And down underneath it, we've got numerous small bundles of smooth muscle. So that's why I would suspect that this is um, probably from the vulva or, uh, vulva or vagina. And then what we have um, over here is a nodule. Right beneath the mucosa. And the cells have kind of oval to round nuclei with uh, fine chromatin and a tiny little punctate nucleolus and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm that has a granular appearance. It's kind of hard to appreciate on this scan but it's kind of a grainy granular appearance. The other thing it has are these little blobs that kind of have a crack around them that separates them from the rest of the cytoplasm. These are called pustulo-ovoid bodies. So this is a classic example of granular cell tumor. Uh, granular cell tumors have this granular cytoplasm. They tend to have cytoplasm merging with each other, so they have a syncytial appearance. 
and it's like all these uh, cells are sharing the same cytoplasm. You can't easily see where one cell ends and the next cell begins, usually in granular cell tumor. Okay, the little pustulo ovoid bodies are quite helpful. Um, and the uh, other thing that's not shown in this case, but usually at least when they occur in the skin, you often have trickling of the tumor in between the adjacent dermal collagen bundles. Sometimes it can even infiltrate down into skeletal muscle when it arises in the extremities. Um, but in this case, it's actually kind of a, a circumscribed example, but oftentimes they're infiltrative um, at the edges, and that's normal. Uh, the other thing to point out is the reason that the cytoplasm is so granular is because these cells are loaded with phagolysosomes. And there's a marker, an immunostain marker, that stains phagolysosomes. That's CD68. So we often talk about CD68 as though it's a specific histiocyte marker, but that's not true. It stains pretty much any cell that has phagolysosomes in it, which of course histiocytes do, but so do granular cell tumors. So it, the classic staining for granular cell tumor is strong expression of CD68 and S100, because these are nerve sheath tumors. They're just an unusual variation of nerve sheath tumor. So S100 and CD68 positive. PAS is often going to stain these granules. In all honesty, most of the time these are diagnosable, I think, um, by just H&E. If you really need something, an S100 will easily solve the problem for you. So granular cell tumor. A couple things to point out. The most common sites for granular cell tumor are um, the, uh, the tongue is, I think, the most common site, actually. And then I've also seen them in the anogenital genital area and also in the extremities. They can kind of occur in a wide range of areas. But the oral mucosa, particularly the tongue, is an important site to remember. And the reason that's important to keep this in mind is there's something that granular cell tumor tends to do. It tends to make the epidermis or the mucosa over top of it grow. And sometimes this growth can be really dramatically um, in, infiltrative looking. It can look malignant and, and what we call pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. And so what can happen is the granular cell tumor can cause the mucosa or the epidermis to grow in a way that makes it get misdiagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma. So these cells are kind of more plump and large and they can look kind of atypical. And like I said, sometimes it can really have a pseudo infiltrative appearance. So the key is, is if you see the biopsy of something you think is squamous cell carcinoma, particularly on the tongue, look down here in the submucosal spaces between the islands of keratinocytes and see if you can find some granular cells because if you do, you should back way off from calling something squamous cell carcinoma. So I've seen examples where, um, where granular cell tumor has made very dramatic um, um, squamous changes that really resembled carcinoma. And I've heard of examples where it's caused misdiagnosis that was really problematic. So not every granular cell tumor does this, but it's an important phenomenon to know about that it can happen and you don't want to make the mistake of calling it squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Oh, the other thing I'll point out is remember, these are nerve sheath tumors. Perineural involvement by granular cell tumor is present in like 90% of cases. I, I can't remember if this case has one, but oh, here's an example of that kind of trickling, almost infiltrative appearance of the granular cell tumor at the periphery. Totally normal, benign finding is common in granular cell tumor. But if you see granular cell tumor wrapping around nerves, that does not mean it's malignant, okay? That is a normal finding, just like a schwannoma arises from a nerve, just like neurofibromas often have involvement of a nerve, so do granular cell tumors because they are neural tumors. And, and it's there in like 80 or 90% of cases, okay? So don't worry about that. There are rare, rare examples of malignant granular cell tumor, and you can go and look that up on PubMed, and there's some real nice papers that explain the features of those, but they're rare and outside the scope of what we're gonna talk about today. So granular cell tumor. All right. So here um, we're dealing with a tumor that's in the peritoneal cavity of a young uh, boy and it's extending back into the retroperitoneum in this case you can see we've got an adrenal gland right here and this is a small round blue cell tumor you can see it's made of round blue cells kind of uniform in their appearance 
And the way the round blue cells, you know, there's a wide, uh, wide list, a long list of uh, round blue, malignant round blue cell tumors, um, and it's good to learn about those. Sometimes there are some diagnostic clues microscopically. Other times you have to use immunohistochemistry and molecular to sort them out. But this is one of those uh, cases that has a very distinct appearance. In this case, the, the most important thing is that the round blue cells are arranged in these little islands or nests almost that are surrounded by this desmoplastic fibrous and vascularized stroma that divides the blue cells into these little nests and islands. So when you see nests and islands of blue cells surrounded by desmoplastic stroma in the abdominal or pelvic cavities of a young male, that's classic for desmoplastic small round cell tumor. That's actually the name of this entity, desmoplastic small round cell tumor. It has a, a strong male predominance, usually uh, young adults or kids and um, in the abdominal peritoneal area or the pelvis. Unfortunately, these are very bad, aggressive tumors, uh, but they have a very distinct appearance because of their growth pattern. I would say the one other thing that I can sometimes consider is, um, is the solid variant of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma can look a good bit like this because you can have these nodules of small round blue cells that are divided by fibrous um, uh, stroma forming these kind of septations. So do keep that in mind. Um, the uh, immunostain pattern is kind of broad and variable for desmoplastic small round cell tumor. A lot of different stains have been reported in this tumor, but I'll tell you the most important ones. The most important take home is that there's co-expression usually of keratin or EMA plus desmin. So keratin and desmin expression, which is not a very common combination, but you can see that here. Um, I will point out though to remember that rhabdomyosarcomas, which are desmin positive, sometimes have keratin expression also, particularly the alveolar form. So don't mistake those, okay? Keratin and EMA expression, co-expression with desmin. Um, and then also um, WT1 will have nuclear staining uh, with, with the C-terminus WT1. So WT1 has both an N-terminus and a C-terminus, and you, it's important to know which antibody you're using in your lab because the one that's specific here that you're supposed to see is the C-terminus um, WT1. So make sure that the antibody that you're using actually detects the C-terminus, not the N-terminus, and it'll be nuclear WT1 expression. Now I'll tell you, I've seen cytoplasmic WT1 expression in a wide range of different things. I'm not really sure what, if anything, that ever means, but what we're looking for here is nuclear WT1. C-terminus WT1, okay? And also do remember that like many uh, small round cell tumors throughout the body. CD99 is often positive in this. So um, as my mentor Sharon Weiss once told me, CD99 is a smart, is a marker of small round blueness. And she was just joking, but I think her point's well taken that you can see CD99 in lymphomas and you can see it in Ewing sarcoma and in other Ewing-like round cell sarcomas. You can see it in desmoplastic small round cell tumor. Lots of things can have CD99 expression. So it's a, a very sensitive marker of Ewing's, but it is not at all specific. And that's really, really important that you know that. Um, so you can use not CD99, but do not trust it alone to help you do, to tell you that something's Ewing's versus other small round, uh, small round blue cell tumors, okay? And finally, the reason WT1 is positive in this tumor is because molecularly this tumor has a translocation of the EWSR1 gene and the WT1 gene. So the Ewing's gene, EWSR1, and WT1 are fused together here. Okay, so an important thing to think about is that remember the Ewing's gene, EWSR1, is rearranged in a lot of different tumors. It's a very commonly rearranged gene in soft tissue pathology and even sometimes outside of soft tissue pathology. So if you were, if you were wondering here between Ewing sarcoma and desmoplastic small round cell tumor, FISH for the Ewing's gene with a break-apart probe is not going to answer that question for you because it's going to be positive for a break-apart in both of those tumors, okay? So you have to be able to either FISH for the other gene or use RT-PCR. So it's really important when you're thinking about molecular testing and soft tissue pathology or anywhere that you know about what abnormality you're looking for. Is it a fusion? Is it a mutation? Is it an amplification? And also that you think about the other things in the differential and if they might have some similarities in the molecular abnormality that they have. And, and then, then you can figure out the best testing modality. So I, could, I would either use a, if I wanted to do a test here to prove this, I would either use a double probe 
uh, fish that's got a, a probe for EWSR1 and another probe for WT1, so a dual break apart, or I would do RT-PCR that would find the EWSR1, WT1 transcript. Um, and so those are the ways that I would approach that to molecularly confirm these. So desmoplastic small round cell tumor, a, a good example of a really terrible disease, unfortunately. So here we have a cartilage lesion. It's nodules of cartilage, not just one nodule, but multiple little islands of varying size, tiny islands, bigger islands, these irregular multiple nodules of cartilage. And we're not in the bone. We're actually in the soft tissue. So you can't see it here, but we're right next to a joint space, the synovial space. Um, and um, this is an example of synovial chondromatosis. It's a, a metaplastic process where you get islands of cartilage, multiple islands of cartilage in the soft tissue directly adjacent to a synovial line space, either a joint space or the synovial space that surrounds the tendon sheaths in some of the tendons. So I've seen this in the wrist, I've seen it in the knee, it can be seen in a variety of different joints. The um, features can vary depending on how long the lesion's been there, okay? But usually the most helpful thing is that you get these multiple islands of hyaline cartilage of varying size and when you look within the islands, there is a tendency for the chondrocytes to be clustered together into these little groups. They're like in these little tiny clustered groups that are spaced out from each other. Let me show you. There's another area that I think is even better, if I recall. Yeah, there you go. These, these little tiny clusters of chondrocytes. So that's a, a, a pretty characteristic feature to me that you see the, those little clustering of chondrocytes. You see multiple islands of cartilage, and usually there's a variable amount of calcification, okay? So there's often calcium deposition in these, and that allows them to be seen on an x-ray. Um, and the older and more chronic the lesion is, the more calcification they tend to pick up over time. So sometimes they can be extensively calcified, and other times they can have only minimal calcification. So um, on an x-ray, they often see lots of little foci of calcification in the soft tissue around the joint, um, and so they have a characteristic appearance. So really here in the soft tissue is a very characteristic example of this. Um, the one main differential you might think of would be like a chondroma of soft tissue, um, which is kind of like the soft tissue counterpart of an enchondroma, uh, which is what you'd call a single benign cartilage lesion in bone. But chondroma of soft tissue um, usually is a single nodule of cartilage. You know, it's a solitary lesion, not multiple little islands like this. And also the fact that this is right next to the synovial line joint space is a characteristic helpful feature. Um, to making this diagnosis. Sometimes these little islands can break loose and get into the joint space and form loose bodies too. So you can see that. Oh, here's a nice example of the little clustering or cloning of the chondrocytes here in these uh, cartilage islands. Really, really nice classic example of synovial chondromatosis. All right. This is an example of a plexiform neurofibroma from a patient with neurofibromatosis type 1. Okay, um, here is the nerve. You can see the nerve is kind of tangled and twisted around and we're seeing multiple cross sections through it. It's massively expanded, much larger than it should be because what happens is the pre-existing nerves get filled up with the neurofibroma contents. It just kind of packs the nerve like a sausage and just expands the outer perineurium um, as it fills the nerve. The the cells, of course, are going to be bland spindle cells that have kind of a buckled or bent or crooked shape, um, or some people like to say wavy, although I don't really love that term. And I have a, on my YouTube channel, I have a whole long video about neurofibromas and neurofibromatosis type 1 if you're uh, interested in learning more. But you've got these Schwann cells as well as fibroblasts and perineurial cells all mixed together. You tend to have these little strips of or wisps of collagen in here that some people have likened to shredded carrots. And then usually there's a variable amount of mixoid, um, bluish mixoid material in the background. So all of that kind of haphazardly mixed together and expanding and dilating a nerve. And then you're going to, because, because neurofibromas are a tangled mess of nerves, grossly they have that bag of worms appearance. When you cut through them microscopically, you'll see multiple cross sections of nerve because of all of the different tangles of nerve getting cut um, uh, through at different levels. So multi-nodularity like this is characteristic of plexiform neurofibroma, but I will point out 
that you should never call something an outright plexiform neurofibroma if you don't know for sure that it had a bag of worms appearance grossly or the patient has known NF1. And the reason is that if you call something a plexiform neurofibroma, you are giving the patient neurofibromatosis. Basically, this one diagnosis is essentially labeling the person for life with NF1, which is a bad disease that has a risk of being passed on to the children, which has a risk of giving you malignant transformation into MPNST. It's a big problem to give someone NF1 if they don't really have it. So you want to make sure this patient had a known uh, had known NF1, so no problem here, okay? So we've got the distended nerves, multiple nodules, and also something I often see in the context of NF1 particularly is that plexiform neurofibromas often have areas of diffuse neurofibroma, that is this kind of trickling, inter intervening um, neurofibroma that trickles into the adipose tissue and wraps around normal structures. You often have plexiform and diffuse neurofibroma coexisting with one another. And that's what's going on here. There's kind of some background diffuse neurofibroma, and then there's plexiform neurofibroma um, here. And I don't think this particular example has it, uh, unless I've forgotten or recalled incorrectly. But in, um, in neurofibromas, I, I told you just like in schwannomas, neurofibromas can have scattered hyperchromatic atypia. Sometimes it can be pretty big atypical cells, and I particularly see that more often, it seems, in patients with NF1. They tend to have more of that scattered degenerative atypia, and sometimes that can cause concern for um, is this transformation into uh, sarcoma, MPNST, um, and there's a, a, again, I've got videos about that on my YouTube channel because it's a really complex um, topic. So in any case, this is a good example of a plexiform NF from an NF1 patient. Okay, and finally, this is a spindle cell lipoma. This, these lesions often arise in men, um, and they're usually in the subcutis, and the most common site is the posterior neck or upper back shoulder region of middle-aged older adult men. But um, as uh, Dr. Jennifer Coe and Stephen Billings and colleagues from Cleveland Clinic nicely described, um, definitely a subset of spindle cell lipomas can arise in women. And when they do arise in women, they tend to rise in unusual sites, not like the back of the neck or, or the upper back shoulder region. So it's good to keep that in mind that, that even though these are definitely much more common in men, women can also get them and sometimes get them in strange locations. So spindle cell lipoma has a wide range of features, but the main things that you're usually going to see are mature adipose cells, fat cells, bland spindle cells that kind of almost have a neural look. They look a lot like kind of the cells of neurofibroma, I think. And then the background is a mixture of collagen, usually kind of strands or ropey bundles of collagen, and usually some degree of myxoid change. Sometimes there's extensive myxoid change that makes these lesions almost look like myxoma. Other times the myxoid change is limited, but um, I find the myxoid change to be a very helpful clue for the diagnosis of spindle cell lipoma. And, but when it's abundant, I find that it often confuses pathologists. I've seen many cases sent in for consult because people were confused by why there was so much blue myxoid background. It's a common finding in spindle cell lipoma. So you're going to have variable amounts of those. Some cases, I have a lot of fat and only a little bit of the spindle cell and the ropey collagen. Other cases have almost no fat or even none at all. And those are the, the Dr. Billings, again, is like a, a published authority on spindle cell lipoma. Um, and he and Andrew Fulp wrote a paper um, together uh, in the past about low fat and fat free variants of spindle cell lipoma. So you can go check that out on PubMed that sometimes these lesions don't have any fat because again, even though the name says lipoma, these are not lipomas molecularly. They have different um, findings. They tend to have abnormalities or loss of the long arms of chromosome 13 or 16. So 13Q or 16Q loss. And they tend to usually have, because of that, um, a loss of one of the copies of the retinoblastoma gene, RB1. So if you do an RB1 stain on a spindle cell lipoma, oftentimes you'll find negative nuclear staining, loss of nuclear RB1 staining. Or you could do fish and it would show one copy of the RB1 gene um, uh, instead of the two copies, which would be normal. So that's not every spindle cell lipoma, but it can be a helpful clue if you're having a really challenging case. Most of the time, these are easy to recognize on H&E. The spindle cells are bland usually, unless um, you have a pleomorphic lipoma, which is on a spectrum with spindle cell lipoma, and they can have these big pleomorphic cells that are hyperchromatic and have wreath-like multinucleation. I don't have one to show you today, but I'll have to do another video in the future on that. 
The spindle cell sometimes palisade, sometimes it's very subtle palisading, and other times it can be very dramatic. And usually you're gonna find some little mast cells floating around in the background. Um, see, look, here's palisade, and there's four guys right alongside each other, or girls. I don't know if they're guys or girls here. And then look, those spindle cells, they're lined up with each other. Um, Dr. Weiss would tell me these are parallel arrays, which is I think a nice fancy way to say it, but I think of them as little tiny attempts at palisading. And oftentimes it's very subtle, but if you see, uh, the reason I bring this up is because the kind of vague palisading and the fact that some of the nuclei can look kind of bent or buckled like that makes you think of a nerve sheath tumor. So if you think something looks like a neural tumor and you do S100 and it's negative, you should think of spindle cell lipoma as a possibility because I think that a lot of times they kind of look like a neural tumor, but S100 will be negative in the spindle cells. These are probably actually fibroblastic tumors that just grow fat with them or grow into the surrounding fat, um, uh, again, rather than actually true fatty tumors. Here's some examples of the rope-like collagen bundles. Very nice. These are going to usually be CD34 positive, okay? Like I told you, many different fibroblastic tumors can have CD34 expression. So I think most of the time these are diagnosable on H&E, but if you wanted to do something, CD34 can stain these. S100 might stain the mature fat cells. You know, Depending on your clone, you'll, you'll see variable amounts of S100 staining in any sort of mature fat, but the spindle cells should be negative uh, for S100 in spindle cell lipoma, okay? So a really nice example of spindle cell lipoma, and these are um, benign and uh, don't cause any problems for the patient. So I think that brings us to the end. I hope that that's been useful to you. I know it was a long, grueling trek through 21 bone and soft tissue cases, but I hope that it helps you to better understand them. Thanks so much for watching.